Today's film answers a question that's been on my mind for a long time. Are 10 magical rings more powerful than my FAO Schwartz limited edition Darth Vader ring that I got in Vegas? Yes. Yes, they are is the answer. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. Folks, you know, I was really happy to be able to do this interview because I absolutely loved Shang-Chi, and it, it, was, it was a really fun theatrical experience. It was, it was great seeing it up on the big screen. Um, I felt safe being masked up in a theater, and everyone around me kept their masks on, which was great. And look, today we have co-writer, director, Destin Daniel Creighton to chat about Shang-Chi. And, uh, you know, this is an interesting film for him. He's He's been in our magazine backstory before for his previous films, and there was so much different in this film, but at the same time, so much the same because he's such a talented director and knows how to tell stories through character. So, uh, it was, it was a, a really fun interview, and uh, Dustin had a lot of great things to say about his creative process, so I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, I hope you check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You can read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And you know, speaking of all things Marvel, Black Widow is our summer issue. It's issue 44. It's still our cover story. And uh, there's there's a lot of great things in there. You could, you could learn all about what is in issue 44, our summer issue, by checking out our table of contents over at Backstory.net. And if you've never read us before, Marvel again, uh, our free issue happens to be the Avengers Endgame issue that we did a few years back and it'll give you a sense of who we are and what we do and if you like what you see i hope you become a subscriber and if you want to become a subscriber you could use discount code save five that's save and the number five and that will save you five dollars off a one-year subscription to backstory magazine and look it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and itunes and spotify and my youtube watchers of the backstory magazine youtube podcast which is you know the only place in the world right now you could see this darth vader ring that i'm holding up and i held up at the beginning of the episode um and uh it's it's where all of our zoom casts go because during the pandemic these have all been zooms since we are doing in-person screenings these days uh so you could watch them all there but look it would it would mean a lot to me to have all of you become subscribers to backstory magazine there's so much great stuff in there. We are one of the only magazines in the world that prints scripts in their entirety in every issue. So there is a lot to explore. So thanks for considering supporting my passion project. But now without any further ado, let's jump right into our conversation with co-writer and director Destin Daniel Creighton about his latest film, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Destin, it's good to see you. Congrats on this amazing film. Thank you, Jeff. I, I've been a longtime fan of your work. We've had you in Backstory Magazine before for Short Term 12 and for Just Mercy. And it's a big deal for an independent filmmaker to get a gig like this. And I would love it if you could put us in the room of what it was like when you were bringing your take on this to Marvel. Um, yeah, I was actually in, I was in post-production on Just Mercy when the announcement was made that Marvel was looking for a director for this particular character. And at the time, I honestly did not think that, that it was a venture that I wanted to go on um, doing a, a giant uh, blockbuster movie. Um, but, but the announcement for this character just struck a chord with me and it took me back to my childhood and made me at least want to go in and, and have a conversation with Marvel about a, a superhero that I would have been proud to, to obsess over and dress up like when I was a kid. Um, and that's, that's kind of how it was at Marvel. It was like a conversation that, and uh, uh, me talking to Jonathan Schwartz, our producer about, what ifs, what about this? We should probably avoid that. And one conversation turned into three conversations. Um, usually a week, a week would pass by and then he'd ask if I wanted to come back in. And then eventually they asked me to come in and, and pitch what I would do if I wanted to direct it. Um, and I, I pitched them a, 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 in a lot of ways, I pitched them an indie drama. <laughs> an indie drama wrapped in a 
a kung, you know, a kung fu movie and a, a superhero movie. Um, I I put together a, a PowerPoint presentation. I'm really bad at speaking to people, so to have a screen that I can look at and just click through while I talk. And I actually had a lot of moving images, scenes from different movies that um, I was inspired by just playing while I was talking out what what this story could be. It's it's always interesting to hear writers using pitch reels. And I'm just curious, how long was your was your reel? Um, You know, people refer them as decks, as lookbooks, as, you know, living reels. How long was yours kind of showing samples from different movies and looks that you would go for? It was about 20 minutes, but it wasn't just 20 minutes of just showing. I, I was I was talking through the the story of um, a, a lot of which ended up being being the, the bones of, of the story of this movie. But I was talking through the dramatic beats and what the turns could be and what certain fight sequences could could be modeled after um and along and i think i think it was about 20 to 25 minutes long one of the things that marvel has been great about is taking a director like yourself who has such a good past of working with actors and trusting them to know that they're going to elicit great performances in the movie and marvel has the apparatus alive to handle the effects and the stunt coordination and everything else so you were a perfect choice for this, and I think it's fantastic. Once you got the gig, I'm curious how the, the screenwriting process worked because you know the other the other writers that are credited are Dave Callahan and Andrew Lanham. And I don't know if they had a draft beforehand that you were writing over or they were writing in tandem with you. Talk us through that briefly, and then I want to hear about your creative writing habit when you're on your own. Dave Callahan was on the project when I got hired. Um, they they hadn't really broken the story yet. Um, so my first meeting that I had was going to a bar and meeting up with Dave for the first time and, and finding out um, where they were in the process, how open he was going to be to new ideas. And we really hit it off and decided to just break the story open together. Um, and, and that's what it was like for about three months or so was just us meeting in a room with Jonathan Schwartz and breaking the story over and over and over until we came up with, with a, um, skeleton that we really liked. Um, so we, we wrote those, those first drafts together, Dave and I, and then when we, when we went out to, um, Sydney to start, start working, Dave was unfortunately unable to come and we really needed a writer on the ground to come because the the process just evolved so much. Once you, once you have um, Brad Allen and his incredible stunt team come on board and start showing us stunt visits and we, we get inspired by that and it ends up wanting to be rewritten and into the scene and same with Bill Pope um, and, and uh, Sue Chan, as she's building sets. All of these things really inspire the the writing process, and we needed another writer on the ground to to help with that. And so Andrew Lanham came came out to Sydney, and um, we we kind of all all worked together at that at that point. Dave from LA and Andrew on the ground with me, and it, it was actually a very collaborative effort to get the script to where it's at. How long did it take you and Dave to get your first draft once you were done with your outline? Was it three months of outlining led to a first draft or was it three months yeah, of writing? I think it was about three months of outline of outlining led to a first draft. And when you sit down to write, I ask this to every writer, what do you go for each day? Do you go for a certain amount of time in your chair writing or a certain page count to hit? <laughs> um, time. Because... <laughs> Um, I don't, I personally don't find a lot of, um, sometimes, sometimes it's good to just pump out pages that suck. Um, and, and it's just good to just pump it out. Um, but I, I, I find, uh, that if, if I can get 
even a, a pay a gr- a good scene or the nugget of a scene out before I stop. That really helps. Um, I try to to finish a thought, you know, finish a scene or finish, and I and then I also try to start the next thought. So I I try to I try to finish whatever I'm working on that day, which is ho- hopefully it's a full fully realized th- scene. Um, and then I, I just throw down brainstormy, what if some dialogue, anything that I can think of to end the day for the next day. So that when I start the next day, I'm, I'm not starting from scratch. I have just a clear thing to, to start moving on. That's, that's a great piece of advice. I've seen a lot of writers say stuff like that and also continuing to move forward rather than rereading the next day, having that starting point is really important. Um, What do you do if you get writer's block, if you get it? How do you battle it? It helps to be a writer director because um, there's so many other things to do. And sometimes, but but I think it's a good, it's, it's kind of a good exercise or model for, even if you are just a writer, that, um, there's many there's many ways to jog your brain and get it kickstarted again for because i direct and i am a lot of times simultaneously writing while going and and seeing getting ideas pitched to me from the action designers or or from the production design like there's a lot of other things that spark um ideas but I, I get the same from jogging like I, or I don't know, exercise, exercise, exercise to me is magic. Yeah. Like, um, and whatever you're doing, I, I think if you can, if you can zone out and get into some type of meditative state, I, I get all of my most interesting ideas um, when I'm not trying really hard to come up with something. Right. It's, it's like taking that left turn opens your mind a little and, and allows for new information, new story and character ideas. To yeah. Enter, so. I, I, I also find that it is, it is, um, it, it makes writing them such a, an, an enrich, enriching part of, of life experience when, um, when you allow for part of the creative process to be, observation and experience and curiosity just in everyday life um i think you can you can still you can be in writing mode 24 hours a day and and have it actually enrich your your life you can notice things that you typically wouldn't notice and uh, appreciate things that you wouldn't uh, um, typically even look at um and uh, I, I find that to be a very kind of heightened um, in the moment uh, way of existence that a lot of people are striving for anyway. And I, I think writers can, can use it as, as a way to, to um, find a lot of wonderful nuggets to put into your, your work. I, t- I totally agree. And, you know, you made this wonderful movie about a hero who's being tested in a trial of fire and you as a director were tested and you rose to the challenge, sir, because the fight sequences were so great. And of course don't reflect really much from your previous experience. The effects looked great and were very thematic and catered to the story. What was something really important you learned about directing stunts and effects that you maybe wish you knew at the beginning of the process, if you could go back in time and tell yourself just maybe a creative habit you picked up about being involved in that huge process, I'd love to hear what it would be. I, I would have told myself to, to not be afraid to jump in right off the bat in, into, into these, these um, avenues that I've never done before. Um, and not jump in in a disrespectful way, jump in like alongside these incredible heads of departments who have been doing this type of work um, for ages and, and carry with them so much wisdom. But what I found in, in uh, over the course of, of time was that they, 
they don't want to be working in a vacuum. There is no magic, magical machine at Marvel that just allows me to do my intimate drama, drama scenes and everything else just falls into place. Um, if I, if, if whoever is at the helm, if you don't have your fingers um, and your vision uh, in, in every aspect of it, um, then the story is not going to be there. The narrative won't be there. And the last thing we wanted for this movie was to have action sequences that that felt completely on an island compared to everything else. We wanted the action to be narratively connected to um, the, the journeys of our characters. Um, and we also wanted a, a specific type of action in this movie, a, an action that was narratively built just physically in in every move that there are that there is a narrative arc to the, the bus fight sequence there is like a very clear almost third act structure to that to that sequence absolutely where, where stakes are being raised there's a lot of setups and payoffs um and that type of narrative storytelling is not doesn't just happen um so so being able to work closely with with these heads of departments was um something i i I, w I wish i started that right off the bat because that was when i had the most fun and it was the most fulfilling was, was when i was working side by side with them you you also had a great knack of growth through character in your action scenes so there was there was always a sense of character and how these characters were growing with each new test they faced, which, you know, thematically really worked for the film as well. It wasn't just, you know, punching and kicking. So I, that was that was something that was always refreshing to see in which skills were growing. And as experience grows, they were growing to be more part of their, you know, the self that they always wanted to be achieving the potential that they always wanted. So that was that was a fantastic element as well. There was so many other things to discuss in the non-spoiler section, but I know we're limited on time, so I am going to move into the spoilers. So podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify, please click pause. And YouTube watchers at the Backstory Magazine page, please click pause. If you have not yet seen Shang-Chi, go fix that. Please go see it because we're going to get into the spoilers now. And, you know, one to start with thematically is, is I think, you know, part of the heart of this movie. You essentially made one of the truest love stories to appear in the MCU, which was really nice to see in which we see the love of Shang-Chi's parents, you know, and we see the way his dad falls for his mom and, and what she had to offer was so strong that he was able to give up his life. At what point did you realize you were going to embed that? Because interestingly, it also becomes his his motivation as a villain whether he realizes it or not because it's all connected to his love for his wife yeah that idea the core of that idea was a part of my initial pitch to to um marvel and it it really was uh coming out of our desire to break a lot of the preconceived notions of this the idea of who the mandarin is and to to find a beating heart for this character that was relatable um that that isn't to say that that when wu doesn't do some some pretty horrific things in our movie um but but i do think that that people will surprisingly relate to this character and the the reasons why he has gone to to do some of these things um but i i i really liked the idea of telling a, a a love story that was not only between um a husband and wife but also uh, between all the members of the family um and and seeing how pain and tragedy shatters that love and sends sends our characters in in different ways um and and watching them take steps back towards each other um we're all parts of parts of this 
this thematic that I, I really connected to. The magical realism also of just the scenes when they're meeting and she's defeating him, you know, it evokes movies like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Hero, like like lots of great classics like that. And it was it was really nice to see a different kind of power and fight being used in a film like this. And you're right that everyone is fractured when she dies and that sends Wu on his path of becoming villainous again, which he had, which he had set aside. And it's an interesting arc because it's really relatable. Whereas someone's not trying to do a power grab. Someone's mm-hmm. desperately trying to gain back the love of their life even though they're mistaken about the route to do it. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, like that's, that's something that I thought really resonated um, with me and, and, you know, my friends that, that were at the, the press screening that I was at. So I, I really got to commend you on that, but that also brings up another level of storytelling that you did so beautifully, which was the f- flashback structure of the movie. Flashbacks can be tricky in which sometimes they're just used for expository purposes to just fill you in on a blank of what's going on. But you really, you really needed out two separate timelines. The, the arc of their childhood, including the death of their mother, and the arc of the present, obviously, and, and, and the battles that they're facing. And it's really fascinating to see when you give audiences those pieces of information. Because even within the flashbacks, you are jumping forwards and backwards at different moments in time. What were the challenges of, of arcing something that complex out and how much did it change in the editing room? Because having a flashback structure does allow for a bit of modular storytelling when needed. If something that you were planning on putting in the third act you feel is going to hit better in the second act, it's a flashback and there's often room for it. But you tell us because your flashback structure was just beautiful. Thank you. Um, the, that is all credit to our editors um, and the the explorative nature of of our post-production process was was um, very exhilarating uh, we actually watched our first assembly with with everything in sequential order um, interesting and and it it just it we immediately knew that, that that's not the way to go. Sorry to interrupt, and I apologize. Was was the script written to, to be in sequential order, or did the, the script have flashbacks? We went back and forth in script format. Some We tried to place to do flashbacks in the script, but we couldn't figure out how to do it. Wow. <clears throat> so we ended up just shooting it, releasing the script, in sequential order for the sake of our actors so they can just, you know, understand how to play every scene. Um, trusting that we will figure it, figure it out. Um, but we knew, we knew right off the bat that we, that that was not going to work. Um, and it, it was, it was pretty quick in the editing process that we found this structure uh, between Elizabeth and Nat Sanders, our first two, two editors. And then, um, you, uh, Harry came in and brought brought a whole nother uh, level of of perspective to everything when when he came in. Um, but it really was a, a really wonderful collaborative effort to find this structure. That's incredible. How long was your editorial period? We, I mean, it's kind of a weird one because we were editing our first act during the the hiatus of our pandemic mid mid shoot um so there was like three months there then we then we shot for the rest of our movie um we finished we edited when we were in we we edited for a couple months november november december still in sydney and then we came back and continued editing until a month ago i think oh wow (laughs) I mean, you, you really unlocked it in the editing room then because like for not as much of it to be scripted as was, and you to, to end up with something so seamless, the way that it's jumping in time. I mean, kudos to you on kicking the tires of your story until the very end and not just settling for what you shot because it, I mean, I'm sure you would agree. It became a different movie than you set out to make with this flashback structure, which is beautiful. Yeah. It became very exciting to use the flashbacks um, to, to help 
tell the the story of a of a young man who is beginning to learn how to look back and look into himself and revisit the things that he's been running from. Um, and that that's always been the in, intention to tell that story, but to but to allow the audience to um, to see the layers of the onion peel off every time Shang-Chi has the ability to think of one of these moments. And then to also be able to, to see each each flashback through the perspective of each of these characters. Right. Um, and it, it actually climaxes to a moment that was so, so, so pleasantly surprising even uh, to me when when we have climax in that in that final um flashback the that reveals the the death of of mom um we don't really know whose flashback that is because it it actually we see it as a we in the editing room see it as a shared flashback right it it seems like third person omniscient point of view yeah but you see like dad sitting there thinking and then you see son sitting there thinking, and then we go into the flashback and it, it's almost like both, yeah. we, we understand that this is the, the memory that they both share. And his sister too, obviously. I mean, you know, one, one question that I had was there's all this talk about, you know, his mission that his father sent him on to kill. And then he just went rogue afterwards. And he finally admits, you know, late in the third act that he did kill on that mission and felt so terrible about it, that that's why he went rogue. Was there ever something that you shot? that was maybe cut from the movie that would have been a flashback of showing that mission that Shang-Chi went on as a teen? No, we never, sh- we never shot it. Um, we, we had versions of writing that scene. Okay. Um, and we, we explored the idea of showing it, but it just didn't. Yeah. I don't, it, it never, it never felt we went we even went so far as to like as to start storyboarding what what a scene like that would mean but do you want to tell us what was on your mind like what you were Uh, what you were thinking of showing no because why because we we probably will show it at some point in the future okay (laughs) so you shot it then or you'll show the storyboards we did not shoot we did not shoot it got it we will show what's in my brain at some point in the future That'll, that'll be cool when you do. Ooh, hey, I'm just jumping in really quick to remind you to check out Backstory Magazine over at Backstory.net. You know, you could read us on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And you know, if you've never read us before, it just so happens that our free issue is a Marvel issue. It's uh, it's our in-game issue, Avengers Endgame. And uh, you could read it at Backstory.net or through our iPad app completely for free to see who we are and what we do. And if you like what you see after test driving us, I hope you consider becoming a subscriber. And if you want to become a subscriber, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. And uh, look, you know, our current issue, issue 44, it is our Black Widow issue. And we have a lot of great material in there uh, and, and a lot of great, you know, TV and other comic book stuff and, and you know, other movies of the summer. We're always updating an issue even after we publish because we are a digital magazine. So we could do that. And uh, if you want to explore what is inside of our current issue, uh, you could just look it up at backstory.net and see our, our table of contents. Um, so look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page for all these Zoom casts that we're doing because they go straight into YouTube as videos. Uh, support my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now, without any further ado, let's jump right back into our interview with co-writer, director, Destin Daniel Creighton about his latest film, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. One of the things that I thought was also really interesting um, as, as kind of the film plays out was the growing of Shang-Chi's powers and, you know, being trained by Nan. How training sequences are really hard, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but how much time did you feel was right to give him and to give Katie, you know, to, to get their chops up ready for that final fight? Because, you know, training montages are parodied from 80s movies. And <laughs> there's a whole lot of learning that goes on when Shang-Chi finally gets the rings and the rules of how he gets the yeah. rings from his father. Yeah. So what, what were your what were your 
your theories there? This was an interesting training montage because to to us, um, it wasn't a um, learn learn from scratch training montage. The, right. This was this was a a, a montage that was. Um, or an, a training exercise that that Nan was using to remind Shang Chi of what he should already know of the things that are already inside him. So that that to us gave us the um, you know the room to have it happen in a pretty short period of time because it actually is just one session. It's not like we're watching them montage through a week of training. Um, and it, it's it's one lesson that that gets Shang Chi one step closer to where he needs to be. Um, it it also doesn't. It's un, unlike some some training montages. It it doesn't end with him with this giant aha. Now I have the secret. Um, it it is actually a training montage that leaves him on his ass and right. um. I, 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 at most gives him gets him one step closer to the place he needs to be. You know, it's it's interesting when your protagonist and here your antagonist's father kind of argue in a film, right? And and how far can that argument go? But I thought was really really fascinating was when when he shows up when Shang Chi shows up at the village with with everyone and Nan tells them your father's under a spell. It's not your mother. He's specifically under a spell. He he takes that and 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 he he believes them. And it's, it's a sensible explanation. It's interesting, though, because something that I was tracking when I was taking notes, when his father shows up at the village, finally, they never tell him explicitly that he's under a spell and he's got to snap out of it. They kind of argue about other things. And I'm curious about the balancing of an argument like that, because, you know, it's interesting in the age we live in when people get stubborn or set in their beliefs and can't change their minds you see things like that in everyday life. So here I was a little surprised and I still enjoyed it, by the way, this isn't a criticism, but I'm just curious about your choice to not have them argue specifically about when we're being under a spell. Yeah, there, I mean, there is a, a we did not turn it into a big thing, um, but Nan does tell him um, that you're, you're being lied to. Um, by a creature who wants to destroy us all. Um, and when Wu responds by saying, is, is this what they told you to his son? I know my wife's voice. Um, and that, that's, as, that's as far as we let the back and forth go. Um, that, that definitely was a, you know, a, a, cha- a challenge as to the, finding the balance of how much we want to sit there and argue argue before the story moves forward but um this you know the i think the emotional drive of the story is what we wanted to continue to explore and the truth is nothing was going to stop this man no, no matter how how much logic was, was thrown in his face nothing was going to stop him from from getting going towards what what he wanted until the truth is literally breaking through and staring him in the face. Yeah. And it was, and it was poetic the way that happened. You know, I, I guess the a great ending point would be just for you as the hero, the, the co-writer director, what were your toughest scenes? Um, your toughest scene on the page and how did you creatively rise, rise to the challenge? And then your toughest scene as a director and how did you rise to the challenge? So the scene on the page that kept you nervous about writing it and maybe you rewrote it, you know, 20 times. Um, how did you rise through that? And then your, your, your toughest scene as a director on set. Scene on the page. Um, oh, those are good questions. I mean, the, the, the third act of our movie of like finding, we, we always knew that we wanted this third act to get to an operatic level of just, of, of, Marvel dumb, um, and we we knew that 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 was important for for this character to to reach that that level of uh, of superpower, um, and not just and not end our movie 
simply as the master of kung fu, but also have um, we, that we see him in, in, in a more grandiose state. The, the writing process of one, figuring out what those beats were um, that, that takes him to that ultimate level and what they emotionally, emotionally mean and represent to him and his inner journey was, was a huge challenge. Um, and I, I, I mean, whether or not people pick up on this emotional journey or not, like I find incredible satisfaction in watching Shang-Chi piece together these parts of himself and his relationship, his, his relationships with his family um, and with himself. And it's, it, it really isn't until he has a moment with each member of his family that, that I think the final beat of healing happens with and also having Katie involved in that that the emotional connection and journey that he's on is is happening simultaneously with these giant giant beast spectacle creature clashes right um, and and I I find a lot of uh the emotional satisfaction in the moment that that Xia Ling looks to him on on that dragon just after Katie shoots the arrow, and she just repeats what her mom told him, which is simply go, and then he just gets up and boom. And that's a great answer for for your your toughest scene on the page. What was your toughest scene on the set? What was the what was the moment where? You were you had to step back and really clear your head for a second on set to tackle a problem that maybe was unexpected. On on set, um, I mean, I'd say probably that one of one of the harder scenes was the that that scene. It's a very simple scene between Katie and Shang Chi when they're sitting on on the water, um, and it's the moment that Shang Chi admits the that he wasn't fully truthful to her um and and it's also the moment that he decides that he's he's going to kill his dad um which is you know it's it's a lot of it's a lot of drama for for one scene um and it it's drama that could easily go awry and become just totally unbelievable um, and it, it, it was not an, an easy scene with the amount of, of generators going and people on set and the, and giant lights and, um, to get two actors to a place of intimacy in that scenario was, was definitely not easy. Um, we, we had to stop a couple of times and take some breaks to try to find the, the core truth of that scene and 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 um i i feel very very proud of of simu and aquafina for getting yeah. through it and and creating a, a scene that i i find very uh very authentic and that's exactly why marvel hired you because you're just so great with actors so of course you you nailed that well look i have plenty more questions that i'll hopefully ask another time but you have been so generous with your time Thank you so much for for chatting with us today, and really, truly, congrats again on on making a highly entertaining to watch and emotionally resonant film. Thanks, Jeff. And that's how the Q and A went down. Special thanks again to co writer director Destin Daniel Creighton for being so generous with his time and chatting with us today about his latest film. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. And now that you've completed listening to this interview, if you want to get more insight into the Marvel way of making movies, I am pleased to say that you could check out Backstory Issue 44 because it's our Black Widow issue, our summer issue, and you could read it over at Backstory.net or via our iPad app called Backstory. And you know, of course, if you've never read us before, it so happens that our free issue is the Avengers in-game issue, which you could read through our app and at Backstory.net as well. And if you like what you see, I hope you consider becoming a subscriber. And if you want to subscribe, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory Magazine. And uh, look, it would be absolutely amazing to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify 
and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all the video of these Zoom casts go, uh, support my passion project. So thanks for considering. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2021. All rights reserved. And you know, folks, if you want to track me down on social media and say hi, I'm Yo Goldsmith on Twitter. I also run the Backstory underscore Mag account on Twitter. It's the same two accounts on Instagram, actually. Yo Goldsmith on Instagram and Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. I believe I have a Facebook fan page in there somewhere. I'm kind of on there sometimes. I'm kind of not. I, I got to get on there a little more. Of course, you could always be old school and email me by sending a letter to backstoryletters at gmail.com. And, you know, if you do, I promise not to respond immediately. So don't worry about that. But uh, actually, I just get backed up sometimes. So don't worry. I actually will respond. Um, but those are the ways to find me. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A, thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.